Thank you for joining CIE's weekly analysis of the Hamas-Israel war with some of the best analysts, scholars, journalists, economists, diplomats from around the world. I'm Ken Stein, the president of the Center for Israel Education and an Emory University professor emeritus of Middle Eastern history, political science, and Israel studies. Our 20 prior webinars are archived on the website, israeled.org. There are audio and video versions of each webinar. The center's work focuses on content, perspective, and sources. We try and stay away from polemics. We've undertaken the learning and teaching of Israel. And if you're benefiting from the weekly webinars or you like the content on the website and you want more, please hit the donate button on the homepage at israeled.org. It is five months tomorrow since Hamas brutally murdered 1,200 Israelis and others on October 7th. They kidnapped more than 240. Israel still seeks to balance freedom of all hostages with Hamas's military and political destruction. October 7th was perhaps the greatest shock in Israel's 75 years. A plurality of Israelis, probably the month before October 7th, and a plurality of Palestinians, maybe not a majority, were prepared to accept some compromise agreement that would separate the populations. But a December 2023 survey by the Palestine Center for Policy and Survey Research notes now that a two-state solution has declined to just one-third on each side of the divide. The point here is not whether it's 30% or 40% amongst Palestinians and Israelis, regardless of how one parses the survey. It's the aftermath and the new reality generated by October 7th. Palestinians and Israelis are pretty far apart, maybe a galaxy apart, on what the political horizon might look like tomorrow. It could be self-rule, it could be autonomy, it could be self-government, it could be a demilitarized zone, it could be a trusteeship, which by the way, the British and the Americans suggested in February of 1948, so that's not a new idea either. Unlike Israel's previous agreements with Egypt, Jordan, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, there is no trust between Israelis and Palestinians today. I repeat, no trust. Sadat and Begin were wary of each other but they trusted each other. Rabin and Hussein trusted each other. And the Abraham Accord countries in Israel trusted each other. And in that context, the international community still is pushing for some tangible administrative or political horizon that can be implemented. With the complications of hostages being held, Israel says it's not yet complete with what it wants to do. It doesn't look like Hamas wants to engage in a truce or ceasefire and Arab leaders are standing on the sideline, pretty reluctant to tip their toes into the discussion about a post-conflict Gaza. There are exceptions. Some of them make statements quietly, but it's rare for people to speak out loud as this war continues. The topic today is Gaza and Gaza tomorrow, whenever tomorrow is. Who will provide the services needed? who will pay, who will administer, who will staff, who will enforce tranquility, who will provide security? Can a moribund or weak Palestinian authority play a useful role? Can the PA actually be reconstituted? Can the Gaza Strip be demilitarized? Can demilitarization exist if Hamas ideology still exists in the Gaza Strip? So we're fortunate today to talk about these issues with three of the very finest minds in the world. Kobe Michael of the Institute for National Security Studies, Nimrod Novik, now a senior fellow at the Israel Policy Forum, Eighth El Omari of the Washington Institute. How does the Gaza war unfold? Into a tomorrow that focuses the Palestinians and Israelis actually living in a measure of tranquility alongside one another. You are asking an impossible question. You're asking an impossible question on a number of levels. One level is so much will be dependent on how the war will end. This is an active conflict. The logic of the battlefield is the one that dominates ultimately any thinking. But it's also complicated because the day after is a concept that is poorly defined. 
we think of it almost as there's an end of the fighting and then there's a day after. Things are going to be a bit messier. I was in Israel recently talking to Israeli officials and there isn't even unanimity on what does it mean to end the war. Does it mean dismantling Hamas as a military organization, which basically would end once their operation is done? Does it mean having a counterinsurgency, which will take a couple of years of that? So there's a lot of questions here. And I think as we look at it conceptually, we have to look at maybe three different phases. You have to look at the kind of transitional phase, the end of the dismantlement of Hamas as a military entity, yet there will be a period in which Israel will continue uh, to do some security work, a counterinsurgency. And in this period, what will apply here is what we call the pottery barn rules. You break it, you own it. At the default, Israel is going to be, in my mind, the country that will have to be in charge simply because no one else will be available to provide any security or anything else. No outside player at this point is willing to come in and provide reconstruction, yet some outside players might be willing to come and provide some humanitarian and rehabilitation uh, assistance. A big question here, of course, who's going to be on the ground on a Palestinian side? And here again, there are political problems and practical problems. The current Israeli government politically is not willing to have the Palestinian Authority, and frankly, the Palestinian Authority itself is too weak. So that's another void. It's a totally different question of what we will do once the war and the counterinsurgency is completely over. And here, I think ultimately that there's no alternative but to have some sort of a reformed Palestinian authority come and take over. Now, what does a reformed Palestinian authority mean? That is a big question, because ultimately, in its current form, minor reforms will not work. We have to talk about a major overhaul of the Palestinian Authority that has to start from the very top, from the president. Is the region ready for that? Is the U.S. ready for that? Uh, and of course, we need to wait and see what happens on the Israeli side. One final point. Uh, I think in all of this, an Arab role is essential. It is essential to give a diplomatic chapeau. It's essential to push the Palestinian Authority towards meaningful reforms. But the Arabs also have their own interests and their own equities here. You talk to Arab officials, and I think you genuinely hear a position that they're not willing to come and pump money into something that's just going to fail again. They want to frame their intervention as part of achieving a Palestinian objective. Everyone is wary of the slippery slope in which they come in and they own the problem. This is just some of the questions we have to ask. One maybe last conceptual point is it's important to look at opinion polling right now and what you described I think would be the case with us for a while. But also it's important to keep in mind when something as huge as October 7th and the war after that happens, societies do not move in linear ways. And we have to keep an eye, maybe in a few months, maybe in two or three years, where is the center of gravity on both societies? And I suspect it will be very, very different from what we have right now. I don't think trust can be rebuilt during that period, but I think a desire for separation could very much be an option that will start taking more hold in both societies. Let me begin by trying to clarify the actual situation that we are in, because I'm not sure that everybody understands the situation. Many people think that we are in a sort of limited local war between Israel and Hamas, and this is not the reality. We are in a regional war where Hamas is a very significant component in a much broader axis, which is led by Iran, the resistance axis. It's supported by China and Russia. In addition to Hamas, Israel is already involved actively in six and a half fronts. The Gaza Strip, the West Bank, South Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, South Syria vis-a-vis -vis the Shiite militias which are led by Iran, West Iraq, the Iraqi Shiite militias, the Houthis in Yemen, and the Iranians themselves. And I haven't mentioned yet the Israeli domestic arena, the Arab citizens of Israel. Fortunately, they are still out of the game. It is a huge disappointment for Yehi Sinwar and for Hamas leadership in Gaza and the Hamas leadership outside. But fortunately, as I say, they are still out of the game. So vis-a-vis -vis all the fronts that I have described, it is a regional war that impacts global affairs. 
mainly the American position in the American hegemony and the international order, which is based on the American hegemony. When we ask ourselves what the hell the Chinese and the Russians are doing here and why do they support the Iranians and the Iranian axis, we understand that they do it because they want to sabotage, to undermine American interests here in the region. And they want to sabotage the American position here in the region because they understand that by sabotaging the American position here, they are eventually sabotaging the American position in other arenas. And at the end of the day, this is something that weakened the American position, generally speaking. And therefore, this is a much more complicated reality than a war between Israel and Hamas. Saying that we are already in the day after. After five months of uh, war in the Gaza Strip and in South Lebanon, in both arenas, we are in a very complicated situation. I think that we are already in the day after. And the day after means that we have reached to the phase or the time that a replacement for Hamas on the ground should be seen in the Gaza Strip. And I totally agree with regard to the only alternative that I see now on the table, which is a temporary military administration, Israeli military administration, at least in the northern part. This military administration should serve, I would say, three purposes or three objectives. The first one is to provide in a much more effective manner humanitarian aid to the local population. Secondly, to signal to the people of Gaza that Hamas is not an option anymore. This is something that will enable, maybe, will enable to decrease the popular support of Hamas among the Gazans because they will understand that Hamas is not an option anymore. And the third objective is to prepare the territory for the next form that will be an international slash regional form, or maybe a sort of an integration of uh, international and regional form, a sort of a trusteeship that will have the responsibility to run the territory and the population and to begin the reconstruction process of the Gaza Strip. And in parallel to that, to educate and to train a local administration in Gaza and gradually and in a very responsible manner to transfer authorities to this local administration in a process of five years or so until this local administration will be capable to run independently the territory and the population. And in parallel to that, we have to assure that the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank will go through a very significant reforms process that will enable the Palestinian Authority to build its capacities, to build state institutions, economy, civil society, reforms in the security sector, and so on and so forth, in a way that in a five years process in parallel to the Gaza Strip and under the umbrella of a new regional architecture that will be based on the normalization process between Israel and the Arab countries, mainly Saudi Arabia, as the leader of the Arab world, of the Muslim world, the two Palestinian entities will go through a reconstruction process, and maybe after five years or something like that, we will be able to establish a sort of a Palestinian federation composed of the Gaza district and the West Bank district, and later on, maybe a confederation between Jordan and Palestine. To conclude, I would say that I don't think that there is any probability or any logic in bringing the Palestinian Authority to the Gaza Strip. There is no even slight chance that the Palestinian Authority will be welcome in the Gaza Strip, and there is no slight chance that the Palestinian Authority will be able to reconstruct the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian Authority is not able to run its own deal, its own business in the West Bank, which is less complicated than the Gaza Strip. And the last sentence in this regard is that the Palestinian society, as well as the Palestinian leadership, must go through a very significant process of change, because at least according to the poll of Birzet University that was held two weeks after the murderous attack of October 7th, 82% of the entire Palestinian population supports the massacre of October 7th. And if the Palestinian Authority till today 
today has not found the opportunity and the time to condemn the massacre of October 7th, and some officials of the Palestinian Authority even promised that there will be more October 7th from the West Bank, then I think that we have a very crucial problem with all the psychological infrastructure of the Palestinian society as such, and with the Palestinian leadership, and therefore there is a need for a very significant process of changes. I agree with Ray's initial comment that the morning after may be a useful euphemism, but misleading one. We're not talking about the moment where we go to sleep in one situation and wake up in another, but rather we're talking about a series of processes, not all synchronized. None of them is a sharp departure from the day before. In that context, Israel faces three clusters of options. Option number one, which I dismiss immediately, is the unilateral evacuation of the Gaza Strip once somebody decides mission accomplished, no matter what the definition of that term. That's not going to happen. Unilateral withdrawal is not going to happen because we've been there before. Twice Israel withdrew unilaterally. Once was 2000 from Lebanon, where unilateralism was imposed because negotiations were not available. And the second time in 2005 from Gaza, where unilateralism was a choice of the leader. Negotiations were available, but he preferred not to. And the result was that in the two cases, the vacuum that we left behind sucked into it. Terror organization, Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in the south, emerged as a state-like military, armed to the teeth, and brutal to boot. Contrast that with the peace treaties with Jordan and Egypt, each one incorporating robust security arrangements and proving resilience for decades. So unilateralism yields terrorism, bilateralism has a chance of proving resilience. So Israel will not go for unilateral. The second option, which I'm afraid is the one that we are sliding in in that direction, and to my regret, it copies advocacy, and that is for a prolonged, open-ended Israeli occupation of the Strip. We all know that the temporary has a tendency of stretching out. And once you start with military governance and with creating structures and trying to induce locals to cooperate with the occupation, we are enshrining rather than ending the West Bank-Gaza separation. But given the fact that this government of ours primarily the prime minister, not for strategic reasons, but for domestic political ones, refused to discuss the morning after from the outset a strategy that should have informed the military campaign. What is it, government, that you want us, IDF, to accomplish at the end of the operation? The operation could have looked quite different with different government objectives, but absent any, instead of policy directives, we had all kind of bravado and machoismo slogan of total victory, demolish Hamas, which the IDF had to translate into operational terms without a political objective. The third option is the one provided by the coalition forged by the U.S., by President Biden and his team, and regional partners. Every peace process has its own lingo. So this group now called the Arab Contact Group, and it involved Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and possibly others. And they have forged a consensus. My information is that there is a willingness on the part of this group, supported obviously by the US, but also supported by the European and the other donors, from Canada to Australia, to make a major major contribution to the Gaza morning after, provided the morning after is not Gaza only, but Gaza and the West Bank, provided the morning after is under the auspices of the Palestinian Authority, and provided it is all done within the context of, again, a new mantra, which reads, quote, a credible, irreversible, time-bound path towards a two-state solution. Now, let me unpack some of this. The logic that drives that coalition is twofold. One, investing in Gaza, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and development, absent a credible for a change. Political horizon is guaranteed to go up in flames in the next war. And that they are not willing to do, and hence the demand for a credible peace process. 
Incredible has its substance. Second, nobody is naive. The PA in its current miserable situation is totally incapable uh, of shouldering responsibility for the Gaza Strip. 15 years of major Israeli investment in weakening the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian leadership's own contribution to its corruption, nepotism, ineptitude, created a situation that the overwhelming majority of Palestinians want Abu Mazen gone and want the PA gone. To rectify that, President Biden copyrighted a new acronym for the Palestinian Authority, no longer PA, but rather RPA, Revitalized Palestinian Authority. A revitalized has a substantial context, but nobody is naive. It's not going to happen overnight. So we're talking about two gradual processes. Process number one is on the West Bank, where the Palestinian Authority is revitalized. It's going to take a year, two, and likely more. But that in and of itself is not going to happen. The PA is far too weak to undertake reforms, even if the leadership wanted. But for the Arab world to gang up on it, along with the Europeans and the other donors, they need an incentive. And the incentive has to be the political horizon on the one hand, and a sea change in Israel's policy on the West Bank and vis-a-vis the Palestinian Authority. Without a sea change in Israel's policy, the PA is totally incapable of revitalization. So that's one process. The second process is Gaza the interim, but this vision has different content. And that is, that subject to the three prerequisites, not Gaza only, PA sponsorship, which at the outset is symbolic, and with the years becomes substantive, and a commitment to a two-state solution by Israel, even though the two-state solution will happen only over the horizon, but Israel will have to conduct itself according to that objective from now on, reversing the trend sliding towards a one-state reality and starting the process of separation gradually, securely. And on the Gaza Strip, the regional slash international mechanism that is willing to come in and take responsibility for developing the Strip, governance, police, and security, but only based on those three conditions. Given that the current Israeli government will not hear of it, of any of the three, we are sliding in the direction that Kobe described, an open-ended Israeli occupation of the Strip. We can have a formula, and we can have points, 25 points on what constitutes autonomy in 78, 79, and 80. And we can write them down on a piece of paper. What you write down on a piece of paper and what the political culture will accept and absorb and will change It takes a long time for that to seep in. It takes a long time to adjust. Why would elements within the PA today want to subject themselves to reform, however you want to describe it, or revitalization, however you want to describe it, when it negates the status quo and it negates the ability of the individuals who are at the top of the establishment from keeping control over power, influence, and money. How do you swim upstream against the political culture? Is it possible? The answer is absolutely not. To expect that the Palestinian Authority leadership right now will engage in reform, having failed to do that and thwarted the previous reform efforts, would be unrealistic. I might use different words than Nimrod said, but let me plagiarize him and say, the PA will only do that if the key actors gang up on the PA. And by the way, you're a historian, so let me go back to a part of history that is not very ancient history and go back to George W. Bush. I was a PA official at that point, so I can tell you firsthand. When George W. Bush first said to us, PA has to reform, and we didn't take him seriously. When we started hearing the exact same message in London, Paris, Brussels, we started to worry. When we heard the same message from the Saudi foreign minister, from the Egyptian president, from the Jordanian king, then we understood that we had no choice but to reform. That created the very reluctant impetus uh, then to start with reform that ultimately produced Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, produced a new constitution, uh, etc. So the PA itself will not do it. You need to have pressure 
maybe with incentive, obviously. And again, Bush did create incentive in the roadmap when he talked about the ultimately a two-state solution, becoming the first American president to accept that. But you need to do that. And this is kind of where things start falling apart. Frankly, this is where I'm a bit more pessimistic. Because today, I look at where I'm sitting in Washington, and I just simply do not see this. I see this kind of as an aspirational talking point. I just don't see the political energy around it. I go to the region, and the region is serious, but there are preconditions. But well, these preconditions are very, very hard to achieve. I see an Israeli body politic that's going to take a while to settle. And certainly, as long as we have this Israeli government, it's not going to work. But all of this to say that if we do not have that kind of external pressure, and it has to be sustained external pressure, because a reform process will take a while. So unless you have that, then yes, it is not going to succeed. I will leave you maybe with a bit more positive or optimistic note. Much as I see that today, the situation is not ripe. I see a trajectory that might get us there. And I see the potential or the impetus for that coming, not necessarily from Washington this time, but from the region. If you today go to UAE, go to Saudi Arabia, go to a lot of these countries, you will see that they actually have started internalizing the importance of good governance as not only the nice thing, but a key for political and security stability. We're seeing them pushing this kind of agenda with other countries like Jordan, like Morocco, etc. So I think a reform of the Palestinian Authority would be something that will fit within a regional trend. But it, I don't think we are there yet. In the meantime, I have to say that much as I do not think that the idea of Israeli direct control of Gaza, et cetera, is a good idea. I see it nevertheless as a default position until all of these things are dealt with. If I have to summarize from the historical point of view, the major or the strategic failure of the Palestinians or the Palestinian leadership, at least since the beginning of the Oslo process, I would say the Palestinian leadership, be it Arafat, or Abu Mazen, his successor, and of course, all the circles around them, they fail in making the transitional process from a national revolutionary movement, the PLO, to state builders. And actually, the Palestinian leadership, with one exception only, Salam Fayyad, that was not part of this leadership, and this was the reason that he was kicked out at the end of the day. The Palestinian leadership was never really interested in building its independent functioning state. They were mostly concentrated in destructing the Zionist project. They brought with them all the illness or all the problems or all the political DNA of the PLO to the Palestinian Authority. Actually, they duplicated the PLO with its organizational and the political culture to the PA. This is the reason that the PA, since day one, was a failed entity. A failed entity. It was with regard to its monopoly over organized violence since the beginning of Arafat and the idea of Hamas and the Tanzim and all the other militias that Arafat played with them. And it continued with all the idea of the inefficiency and the dysfunctionality of the state institution or the Palestinian Authority institution, corruption, absence of accountability, no law and order, there was no an independent functioning law system, and so on and so forth. Therefore, I think that talking about the idea of reforms or revitalized Palestinian Authority, where the keys are still in the hands of Abu Mazen is something which is totally disconnected from the reality. As long as Abu Mazen is there, and as long as the old guard of the PLO is there, and they are holding the key positions, I don't see any real probability for any significant reforms in the Palestinian Authority. Salam yeah. Fayyad said in an interview maybe five years ago, the key to our success is for us to engage in empowerment even before we're assured of having a state. And then he proceeded to say, you know why the Zionists succeeded? Because they engaged in empowerment for 50 years before 1948. Exactly. And this is the reason that Salam Fayyad was termed as the Palestinian Ben-Gurion. 
This was exactly the very constructive approach, strategic approach of Salam Fayyad. We do not withdraw from our grand vision about our ownership on Palestine from the river to the sea, but we are not able to realize it now. So let's concentrate on building our capacities. Let's concentrate on building our society, our economy, our institutions, our security apparatuses. And this is exactly what he did. And he was a huge reformer. He was so so respected by the entire international community and by Israel, and I think by many Palestinians as well, but he was not respected by Abu Mazen, by the old guard. Why? Because he dealt with the corruption, with the nepotism, and they felt that they are losing control over the system, and they throw him away, just open the door and throw him away. And now the idea of the resignation of Muhammad Ishtaya and the idea that Abu Mazen accepted the resignation, but he says that the time is not ripe yet to establish a new government and he has not nominated yet Muhammad Mustafa. But who is Muhammad Mustafa at the end of the day? Who is Muhammad Mustafa? Muhammad Mustafa is the closest economic advisor to Abu Mazen. He is a senior member of the PLO. He was even a minister in the Palestinian government three, four years ago. He is still in active duty as an advisor to Abu Mazen, and he will lead the reforms in the Palestinian Authority. It's a joke. It's a joke. I would like to refer to something that has been said by uh, Nimrod about the absence of political objectives to the war. I totally disagree with you, Nimrod. I think that the objectives that were set by the government are very, very clear, and they are political objectives in their essence. The first objective is the dismantling of the military and the governmental capacities of Hamas in a way that Hamas will not be able to be again an effective military or governmental entity in the Gaza Strip or in any other Palestinian territory. This is the first objective of the war. The second objective is the release of the hostages. And the third objective is to create a new reality in the Gaza Strip in a way that will ensure that the Gaza Strip will never be once again a security threat on Israel like it was until October 7th. All of these three objectives are very reasonable, very doable. I think that the IDF does very impressive work in the Gaza Strip, and this is not my estimation only. We have to listen carefully to John Spencer from the United States and to Richard Kemp from the UK. Both of them are leading experts with regard to urban war. And listen carefully, what do they say about the achievements of the IDF there in the Gaza Strip? But we have to understand that we are dealing with the most complicated urban warfare zone in the world ever. Since ever, we are talking about such a big organization of dozens of thousands of terrorists, which is so deeply embedded in the civil society. 85%, 85% of the entire buildings and civilian facilities in the Gaza Strip were infected by Hamas. They were used by Hamas as terror and military compounds against Israel in order to terrorize the citizens of Israel. The idea that at the end of the day, Hamas does not exist anymore as a functioning military organization and in a very marginal manner as a governmental uh, entity in the Gaza Strip. And when we will accomplish the mission in Rafah, there will be no Hamas there. We will have Hamas as guerrilla or terror, exactly as we have some other factions as terror and guerrilla in the West Bank, but it will not be as it was until October 7th. And therefore, I think that the objectives are very clear, very doable, very reasonable in this regard. And I don't think that you are right by saying that there are no political objectives to the war. Back when Shimon Perez was dancing with George Schultz and you were playing the violin or the bass fiddle or the drums, whatever it was, alongside, the phrase that was used was, we need confidence building measures. If you were to provide a prescription for the next Israeli government, what three or four confidence building measures would you suggest would be doable, 
and operational. So I'll come back to this in a second. The best tradition of Israeli pluralism, Kobe and I are accentuating the argument over what we agree upon, and then what we disagree somehow disappears. We agree that the IDF is performing in an unprecedented way given the circumstances, and I've read and listened to and discussed with the same experts about the appreciation for what is being accomplished over there. We also agree that undoing Hamas military and civilian capabilities, as well as bringing back the hostages, are very clear objectives. Where do we disagree? We disagree on the third one. For the government to say that the morning after is no Abbas and no Hamas, and say nothing about what will it be, what is the yes, is the most important missing link in navigating the operation. If from the outset, on week three, the IDF would have known that the objective is to bring inside Gaza the morning after a certain third party that is under the auspices of the Palestinian Authority and that takes over every segment that the Israeli handover to the third party is gradual, gradual two ways. One geographic, and the other one is functional. And therefore, northern Gaza would have been handed over long ago, instead of leaving it open for Hamas resurgence. And now our IDF is coming back to clean it up. And now we've cocked up some nonsense about local gangs and local amulas to run the place when these people are mafia-like fighting each other and taking care of their own rather than the general good, we are creating a mess in the northern Gaza until, as you said, Kobe, there will be an Israeli military government that will impose law and order and everything else, which will enshrine a long-term occupation. The second issue where we disagree is that the early Abu Mazen was the kind of gentleman that you described, who never made the transition on two fronts one from a revolutionary organization, and the other from the vision of from the uh, Jordan to the sea. Uh, Abu Mazen was a very different kind of leader in the early times. With time, he changed. And in the best tradition of Israeli pluralism, while you focus on the faults of the Palestinian Authority, I prefer to focus on the failures of the Israeli government. Why do I do that? First, because I'm an Israeli, and I expect more from my government than from any other. Second, I believe that Israel is by far the strongest party and the strongest player and holds most of the cards in the game. And three, and most important, it is our national security and national viability interest that we are not sliding into an ever-conflicted one-state reality. And therefore, I would have expected my government over the last decade not to invest in weakening the Palestinian Authority. They are doing a bad job on their own, but rather at least do what we are empowered to do in order to strengthen it, give it space to work rather than choke it. And I'm not talking only about smart rich but, today, but what, choking what them financially. Both of them, Kobe, I didn't interrupt. It will be as effective when I'm done. So on both sides, course, I take issue about it, including about the Palestinian security forces, which in the early phases, trained by the USSC, the United States Security Coordinator, and his mechanism, and the Jordanians and others, was the pride and joy of the Palestinian people when they walked into the street. I'm not so sure that it's not the only Arab street where when you get a ticket, you cannot buy your way out with a 50 shekel bill. They were the symbol of a state in being until our policy transformed them into subcontractors of the Israeli occupation and they lost all credibility with their environment. Again, the Palestinian Authority is corrupt, inept, nepotism widespread, and the current Abu Mazen will not volunteer. And no need for you to belabor the point that Mohammed Shtaya, replaced by Mohammed Mustafa, is one cloning with another. Only the first one tried to be a little independent, and he's been replaced with one who has yet 
to show that he is willing to try and be independent. We know that. Palestinian reform will not come voluntarily from within. Nobody in this room of four of us has argued that. So there's no need to invest in disputing it. But the question is, one, assuming Israel changes and the time comes and the three prerequisites are met, can the Arab world, as I said, gang up on Abu Mazen and force his hand? And two, until then, some in Washington realize that if you hinge the entire regional stabilization on Palestinian reform, you are relieving everybody else of responsibility. And therefore, they are beginning to internalize that you got to go slow on Palestinian reform. We survived with the current Palestinian unreformed entity. Until now, we can survive another year, year and a half, until circumstances change and the time for reform comes. By making your argumentation with regard to the expectation from the Israeli government and from the Israeli side as the stronger side, you have to refer to some basic facts. We were the stronger side even on October 7th and we saw what happened. We are the stronger side vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah and we see what is happening there. We are the stronger side vis-a-vis -vis the Houthis and vis-a-vis -vis all the militias here in the region and we see what is happening here. So it is not so clear cut. Secondly, with regard to the responsibility of the Israeli government, how can you blame the Israeli government after what Ehud Olmert offered to the Palestinians in 2009 in Annapolis process, after a Kerry initiative in 2014 when Israel accepted it and President Obama till today is waiting to the answer of Abu Mazen, at the end of the day, you know that the core issue is not the territories, is not even Jerusalem is the idea, the historical refusal of any Palestinian leader to accept the right of the state of Israel to exist as the nation state of the Jewish people in any borders, in the any borders. Well, and we just made. have to see what is the going there is with the the curriculum and what Abu Mazen says in his tongue. And we have to listen carefully to the things that are said by Palestinian officials and leaders. We just have to listen carefully and mainly not in English and Arabic. As our former chief Supreme Court justice used to say before I speak, I'd like to say a few words. We can go back and forth on what we think about the Palestinian leadership mindset and so on. I don't even wish to bother because for me, this is a secondary issue. The primary issue for me as an Israeli is what's important for Israel. And if what's important for Israel is to separate from the Palestinians in a secure way, and I'm not talking about two-state solution tomorrow morning. I'm talking about separating the population, reducing friction, then the policy of accelerated settlement, the policy of empowering violent settlers to provoke Palestinians in the territory, the policy of allowing Benzvir to provoke the whole Muslim world on Temple Mount. These are all Israel, and this is Israel the strong, and it has nothing to do with the intelligence failure of October 6 and 7, and it has nothing to do with our balance with Hezbollah, it has nothing to do with that. These are Israeli initiatives that undermine Israeli strategic long-term interests. Now on CBM, that's easy. I belong to a group called Commander for Israel Security. Kobe belongs to INSS. Both of them have, in the past few years, put together frameworks very similar on what a beginning of a change is going to look like, and I'll mention only one. I think that Mark Index book on Kissinger is excellent, and there is one lesson coming out of it. The territorial element is more important than anything else in indicating intent. And therefore, redesignating small portion of Area C as A and B can go a long way in demonstrating to Palestinians and to the Arab world and to the Western world that Area C is still on the table. I'm reminded of a very broad concept that was provided by former American ambassador to Jerusalem from 1977 to 1985, Samuel W. Lewis. Sam said many, many smart things over a lifetime. And one of the important recollections I have is him turning to me and said, 
remember, Ken, the mediator can't want an agreement more than the respective sides. And until they want an agreement, there's no amount of force and no amount of coercion from the outside that will change it. It has to be in their interest to make the change. Sam was wise. And maybe that was for 77 to 79. But it still, I think, holds is you have to have the sense on the ground that people are willing to look at each other, respect each other, recognize each other's dignity, trust each other. Otherwise, it's really a one-sided operation. When you bring two Israelis to the room, the Palestinians hardly get to talk. You know, you guys have covered it. It reminds me of my negotiation days where I sit back and let the Israelis negotiate among them. But really what I saw here is just an example of how far away we are from just even having within each society any clarity of where it's, it's going. There's transformations happening both places. And in the meantime, just how do we manage the reality in a way that doesn't give us into a further kind of downslide? That's an excellent summation. Thank you all for joining us. 